Oh, shalom, my brothers and sisters. And um, <clears throat> I'm doing this particular lecture right here. It's more of a reminder. It's a reminder of not just the faith of Kadamawi Hadassalase, but the true work in real time of His Imperial Majesty that the evildoers, the evildoers who currently almost totally control this this world system of men and people have attempted and somewhat seemingly successfully to um, suppress and to erase the the truth of his imperial majesty but no matter how many lies or who they may try to deceive the truth will always the truth will always rise to its place now let's Let's begin off right here. We want to speak on His Majesty Kadamawi Haile Selassie and speak on the work of the King of Kings in in, in real time. And I think what's particularly um, interesting is is when you look at the nuclear thing. We're hearing about the war. We're hearing about Iran. We're seeing some of the the prophetics. You know the prophetic. Um, timeline actually coming to pass. Um, if we look at even this tribulation calendar, this is by um, Helena Lehman, and this is one of the few uh, researchers that really, um, because they're approaching it from the Judaic, you know, the, the the Judaic foundation of prophecy, and also connecting rightly um, some of the signs and symbols from ancient Egypt, and and receiving this in a faith of the Messiah, in other words, she's one of the one of the Jews, what you could say, for Jesus or for Yeshua. So, so having Hebrew eyes and Judaic eyes on on the teaching of Christ in the Bible actually gives us a very important insight that so-called um, nominal Christians and Gentile Christians cannot and and have not um, given us so. And looking at where we're at in this um, prophetic um, timeline right here, as you see, this is the 2012, you know, saying the 2012 particular time, as you see um, on her chart here, it speaks of um, Psalm 111, 2011, and the Hebrew year 5771. Now, 2012, the year we're in, Psalm 112. 2012 and the Hebrew year 5772. Now this ties in with um, some other um, lectures and teaching and vids that that we've been doing. And since there's a lot going on, there's a lot of moving pieces in, in prophecy. And so we like to first of all is refer to some of the information, such as this chart here by Helena. Um, Lehman, L-E-H-M-A-N, look her up on the internet, you'll find some of these um, interesting sites and charts right here. This is now speaking about certain um, um, central events. First of all, let's get a good, a good perspective of this chart right here. Um, there's a lot going on in this chart, but we'll try to go over it. Okay, it begins over here, as you can see, um, 20... Oh seven. Now it's interesting from an Ethiopic perspective. Uh, Two thousand and seven is actually the beginning or the start of what we know as the Ethiopian millennium. The Ethiopian millennium. That's that's actually counting um, nearly uh, seven thousand uh, seven thousand five hundred. We can say years. So we're talking about seventy five. Hundred years, um, the eighth millennia is called from an Ethiopic um, perspective. So this is very significant, and without the the full 360 degrees, you know, which is from a Western Gentile Eurocentric point of view, a lot of this is missing, and, and uh, on some levels because of the the racism. You know what I'm saying? Because of a lot of the racism and the evil, you know, the evil hearts and minds that certain otherwise well-seeming Christians might seem to have, they avoid that Ethiopian testimony because of it, it goes directly, uh, diametrically opposite of what many of their people have been saying in 
you know, in the and doing um, against the once lost but now found Beit Israel or or black peoples in the West who are who of them not all black peoples in the West are Israelites or Hebrews in the sense of Beit Israel, but the spiritual that remnant we're speaking about the remnant and. For I and I, that remnant, we find that remnant of that elect of the remnant is Rastafari, is Rastafari. So we have a, the Ethiopic connection here, 2007, the Hebrew year, 5767. Now, what's interesting is in 2008, um, Helena Lehman, or Lehman, she puts on her chart right here, Psalm 108 war may lead to World War Three. Right now, this is a little bit dated. We can look at when exactly she put this put this out, but I think it was out for a while. And she's pretty consistent in what she has been bringing forward and giving you the the background, so you can check it out for yourself. This is what we give thanks, you know. And we say Baruch Ata Adonai for ones and ones righteous Gentiles or righteous um, converted Jews like her who are focusing on Yeshua, focusing on prophecy. Yovas and bringing all the information, the data, including the Ethiopic sources such as the Ethiopian Enoch, into the mix to really see what the scriptures is really saying and how it can um, not just warn us but prepare us, how we can be prepared, how we can know what the divine signs are and what divine time we're in. So this is 2008, right? Then it says that the hidden prophecy in Psalm 108 tied to 2008 pictures. The entire West, the, the, the entire West, the Western world or the West depicted by Taurus, and Taurus is that bull. You know what I'm saying? Now we can see the mundane bull even on Wall Street, which is part of that West, the heart economically and otherwise of the West, at war, right, with the Middle East. And it says maybe by end, maybe by 2011's end. Now, if you recall the news, that's been going on this whole war with Iran and Iran has military um, or Iran is trying to get nuclear um, weapons although Iran says that it has no intention and has gone on the record for, for that but the so-called Zionists now this one is 2011 this one here is copyrighted 2011 so let's just note that it's copyrighted 2011 we've seen some of our older charts and I followed some of her work, and it's very accurate tying in the, um, the, the, the Hebraic interpretation, such as when we see things like periods of time, you know, mentioned as moons or months. Months refer to moons. You know what I'm saying? So the, there's, there's a great, not just possibility, but there's, there, there's, a, there's a probability, and we know this, that if we look at the scriptures from its it's Hebraic and it's Afro-Shemitic um, roots, then we really can understand what the Bible, even in its translation, is um, saying to us. So we see this chart here. This is the lower part of the chart. So they're saying maybe by 2011's end. Now it seems as though that has been knocked off a little bit because we've already passed by that particular time, but we can look at the news. Perhaps there's some significant things that have happened in the news. So now here she has a solar eclipse, which is expected on August 21st, 2017, between the sun, the moon, um, Regulus, in conjunction in Leo. Now we know Leo, the const constellation Leo, this is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So there's more significance there. So let's just zoom in on this a little bit right here and get a little clearer, a little clearer view of what's going on right here. So here we have, this is for 2017. 2017. All right, now, as for 2017 right here, this conjunction, you know, saying that is to occur. Now, she also now seeks to interpret this, and this is from a known system of interpretation. In fact, we're coming out with a document called uh, Witness um, of the Stars, the witness, the, the gospel and the scriptural witness of the stars that tie into even Dendera, and when you know how to um, interpret 
you know, how different cultures encoded this this um, astro-theological information. And we're looking at this from a biblical, scriptural perspective because he says in the Bible that his glory is in the heavens. You know what I'm saying? And the, and the heavens, you know, night to night, you know, this reveals, you know what I'm saying, reveals revelations and knowledge is in there for the faithful and true people that recognize the divine or the heavenly sign. So now at the top part of this, this is a very large, um, a very large um, um, chart right here. But as we move this more close to where we're at right now, this is 2011, right? 2011, speaking about Ophiuchus or, or Scorpio, speaking about some of the partial eclipses, you understand? And the blood, you know, the blood moon, right? December 10th and also Israel's divided. We see the division, even the divisions among Israel or those who call themselves Israel, whether it's us as as the black sheep or whether it's the so-called other sheep or some say the goat, the other Jews, there's still a division among Israel, right? So Israel is divided. Now we have the second grand cross. Now this is, remember this chart here is, is 2011. This is 2011. But I thought this was interesting down here where it speaks about the restrainer of of evil now this elanine is still is still moving around you know this elanine you know this comet or this asteroid or this spaceship or mothership or whatever they want to call it is still moving around now she pointed out something based on what the heavens are showing right here but now as we move it over to this column here's where it gets interesting as we move this a little bit further over to this column right here. And let's bring this up right here. So we have to understand that when we're speaking about the day of the Lord, you understand scripturally, and we have some more vids that we're going to upload concerning the day of the Lord and even a Pat Robinson 700 Club clip that spoke about a technological dark day. Imagine the stars that fall from the the heavens according to revelation are the satellites you understand and along with this we're going to get different tides by different eclipses and different sort of um sort of well the scripture explains it very well and and here she gives her own testimony over here but the scripture says luke 21 and 25 and there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Now, a lot of this stuff has been news to you, you know, when it's a major incident in the news, but they put it as novelty things. Scripturally speaking, these um, signs, when you hear about signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, are not novelty things. But the true knowledge of the scriptures you understand, is not really taught in, in the majority of churches and, and in nominal religions. So you have one saying, Lord, Lord, you understand, but not doing that which he wills or that which pleases him, that which helps to establish the true kingdom and true righteousness in the earth. Now, Helena Lehman, she says here, according to a dream vision that she had, Elamin, will trigger earthquakes, media showers, tsunamis, and a major pole shift. Now, we spoke about this major pole shift, and, you know, based on some computer graphics, you know, and vids that were out there. And, um, of course, that might seem like a lot, you know. A lot of folks say, well, no, it, that's, that's not going to happen. We're not saying this is going to happen on... December 21st, but we're moving into this time, and based on already the signs that are being revealed and how they line up with a true interpretation of the scripture, plus the science and the technology that's giving us accurate information, even from the heavens and other events and, and triggers that are happening in the earth. So there's a fulfilling of the sixth and the seventh seal, and the first through the fourth trumpet judgments. So there's a possibility. Now, we're still in range for this. You know what I'm saying? We're still in range for this, right? 
So this here is the column for 2012, where we're at. So let's go down this column for a moment and put this into perspective. Now, this is interesting that there are to be no full eclipses in 2013. You understand? Know Some might liken that to the silence in the heavens before the first trumpet, a period of no heavenly signs, you understand, know like 2013. They say based on, you know, based on some pretty solid research, there are expected to be little or no heavenly signs in 2013. Now, December 21st, 2012, the Earth aligns with the Sun and the galactic center on the winter solstice in Ophiuchus between Sagittarius and Scorpio. Now, we pointed out that scripturally, this also has a great significance as well. When we look at this in its in its in its scriptural, we have we have uh, um, Gad, right? Gad, which would be the the Hebrew the Hebrew Sagittarius, and then we have the tribe of Don, which would be the Hebrew um, Scorpius Scorpio. Now, if we move this right here down, they say that Elamine may cause a sixth seal. Um, earthquake and pole shift. Now, we know that based on um, the scientific reports, you understand, that the, the whole polar shift, that there's some polar shifting going on, exactly what's the outcome of it, we, we haven't been given that, but it's in progress. In other words, it's in progress, and no doubt many of the strange weather effects that we've been receiving have to do with this. Now, it has a trident right here, uh, Hanukkah, right? This is an anti-peace sign. This right here, this is what they call an anti, some would say a peace sign, but really it's an anti-peace sign. And this also now signals the four horsemen of the apocalypse when you study the star, the star charts, right? The star charts. Now, moving it further down right here, we can see we're still in 2012, right? We're still in 2012. Now, the sixth seal equals massively destructive pole shift. This is why we pointed it out to ones and ones that we're not saying that this is going to happen, but all the, even much in the scriptures when properly understood and read where it speaks about the sun rising in, in different regions of the world would not mean that the sun is going to move its position, but that somehow the earth or the tectonics of the earth would um, move or change their position. Now we have Revelation chapter 12 here, and we have Isaiah 66 and 2 right here. But the, the more interesting not even more interesting, but also very interesting connected with that. When we move over here to 2011, we have two witnesses tied to the first seal. We have Psalm 108 war equal World War III in 2011 or 2012. When we look at the political atmosphere concerning so-called Israel, the state of Israel, Jezreel, and um Persia, ancient Persia, Iran. I mean, there is much for us to be very, very prayerful about. And what is our prayer? Our prayer is that we be saved from these things and found worthy to stand before the Son of Man. That, you know, that, that he saves us and, and protects us and keeps us from these evil days and evil doers. But these things have to come to pass, especially that which is written have to come to pass. Now, some say that there might be a, a rapture of sorts or a, a Pentecost, a Pentecost, a, the Shuvuot, you know, saying could happen, some say, any time through the end of 2012. Now, exactly what sort of, whether it's a spiritual rapture, a spiritual and, and soul, psychical rapture, whether it's a spirit, soul, and bodily rapture is still something that many ones um, might debate. But definitely there is a higher, you know, a higher consciousness or spiritual awareness 
that many of us are aware of. And even on the spiritual level, that is a rapture. Things that we was, wasn't able to see or receive before, we're able to understand it perfectly now, or more perfectly. You know, and we're perfecting ourselves as we're growing in the knowledge. He says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Now, here I found this to be interesting, what she has here at the bottom of the chart. And let's see if we can move this out a little bit and get it more. Try 150. Try 150 on this right here and get it more into, into perspective. Like I said, there's a lot going on in this particular in this particular chart right here. There's a lot going on here. Here speak about the sun and moon and Venus and Regulus in conjunction and our Nittak at Zenith above the Giza Plateau on sunrise on September twentieth, twenty seventeen. So this is connected with the other with the other um celestial like uh um that looks almost like a, a eclipse of some sort. Now here we have, here we have the east. You know, here here we have the east, right? We have the river towards the east. We have the constellation of of Leo. Over here we have the Giza or the Agassiz Plateau and Menquares Pyramid. Then there's a illustration of the elements, the interpretive key. So when we see sun, is speaking of the son of God. When we see Jupiter, is speaking of Messiah. When we see Leo, is speaking of Lion of Judah. When speaking of the moon, the bride of Christ. The Virgo is the true church. Venus is the morning star. Regulus is symbolic of king of kings. Orion is the warrior prince. Al Nittak is the great pyramid. And now the great pyramid is also the altar. And you'll see that within, I think, Isaiah, Isaiah, I believe it's 1919, if I'm correct, Isaiah 1919, when there's a very interesting cryptic, somewhat cryptic, when you ask one, well, what this mean in the reality, turn to Isaiah chapter 19. So we go to Isaiah 19, um, 19, 19, it says, in that day, Shall there be an altar to Yod He Wal He or Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt or Mitzrayim, and a pillar at the border thereof to Yahweh or to Yah to Jah, right? According to the King James 68 um, verse 4. Now, and it's better to say Jah than to say even God in that sense, because God comes from a different Eurocentric culture, while the Jah is more correctly Yah, as Hallelujah. But it's one sign, one little sign in King James of, of the more correct um, name of the true creator, the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Shu HaMoshiach. So the great pyramid is that altar that we see witnessed in Isaiah um, 19 and 19, right? Now, the great sphinx is, is Leo Virgo. The great sphinx is the Leo Virgo. There's a conjunction, right? Leo Virgo. Then Leo or Virgo Leo, also symbolic of the first and the last in that order. Virgo, the first, Leo, the last. Now, Orion's belt, which is up here, Orion's belt Orion's belt is the Giza pyramid. When we see how the Giza pyramid down here reflects this up here, Orion's belt. These three, these three stars right there. Orion's belt, the the Giza or the Agassiz pyramid. So the three Agassiz pyramids or Giza pyramid, they equal Calvary. So in type, we have Calvary. You understand? Or the cross of Christ between the two thieves. We have that also um, in, in um, metaphysical, spiritual, and Christological, heavenly terminology. Remember what Christ said? He said, if, 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 if you don't understand earthly things, how can you understand heavenly things? But it's for us, when we grow up to him, to comprehend these heavenly signs in tune 
with his word as Helena um, Le Lehman does a good job right here and we highlight this and recommend you check her stuff out on, on the web now Mars equals blood sacrifice Mars is symbolic of blood sacrifice and then Mercury equals it links with the word of God and the now river as you see right here is a symbolic of baptism so we're understanding these ancient types and when we can comprehend these ancient types we can see the true story of Yeshua being told even from ancient times because he himself says in Revelation 3 and 14 that he is the Amen in ancient Egypt the Amen was known as as the hidden one the hidden God Isaiah says that you are a God that hideth thyself but now he has made himself what incarnate you understand, has been born as one of us, taking on our humanity or the Ethiopian humanity, thus his, his, his complexion and, and the woolly hair. You understand, taking on our nature because the original fall of man was the fall of the black man. So this is why we have to recognize there's a bigger picture to what's really going on and we have to get past just that kind of checkerboard black and white thing and get really to the root of the truth is that we as the once lost but now found Beta Israel have a God problem and the Moshia our black Lord and Savior he has come to solve that systemic anomaly and to give us a gateway or an access to return to him through the elder brother, through our big black brother Yeshua, HaMoshia, or Jesus Christ, Jesus Christo. So now, what we see right here is that the Christ angle inside of the Great Pyramid, it mimicked above and below the horizon. So, so, so we have a kind of as above, so below, a linking here with Orient, and here it says in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I am coming quickly. Now, of course, there are some folks who would say that this is um, so-called uh, divination. You understand? Or we're not to deal with so-called astrology. You understand? Not to deal with astrology. But what they don't recognize is that the mystery of God in the Scripture, and throughout we can show this in Revelation, we can show this in other prophetic books. In fact, if you turn your Bibles to um, Amos, Amos for one moment, Amos, Amos chapter 5, let's go to Amos chapter 5, so you can understand even um, the last clip that we showed with, with Orion, in fact, we might use this every time we, we address this, because there's some well-meaning people who really sincerely believe that we're not to comprehend God's signs in the heavens but that goes opposite of what's written in the bible reference um psalm 19 read psalm 19 and first pray that that yeshua adonendo opens up your eyes so you can really comprehend that the glory of god is written in the heavens but just like reading comprehension a lot of folks you know like if you want to hide something put in the book you understand the almighty put this book you understand this book is written in the heavens. So the heavens are telling us something, and we need the scriptures to properly decode it. So when we look at Orion for a moment, let's just go back to, to Orion, bring it back so we can show you exactly where, where Orion is on this particular chart right here. So you can see at the top of the, right there, there's Orion, right? There's Orion. This is often how... Orion is pictured as a as a warrior. Now, Orion is that warrior prince, right? And also speaks about the seven sisters or the seven stars. Now, when we go to Amos chapter five, verse eight, it says, "Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning." This is a very very cryptic in a sense. What does this mean? To seek the one who makes, who, who is the creator of the seven stars or the Pleiades and Orion, this particular constellation in heaven that we see pictured and mirroring, mirroring the Giza or the Agassi Plateau down here. 
So we can say, as above, so below. Now, you've got many interpretations, perhaps, of this, but really none or very few from the biblical perspective, you know, which says that all of this testifies, even the heavens testify to the glory of the King of Kings and his Christ, our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua, HaMoshiach, Jesus Christos. This is what we're saying, and we're proving this, you understand, from other brothers and sisters in our own works. And this particular chart here, once again, is called the Tribulation Timeline, Helena Lehman, right? So here in the scripture it says, Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion, and turneth the shadow of death into the morning, and maketh the day dark, a dark day with night, that calleth the waters of the sea and poureth that key word Aquarius the pouring out poureth them out upon the face of the earth Yahweh is his name Yahweh is his name and if you go into it even a little bit more um, <laughs> it is it is very interesting this particular this particular chapter 5 and we, we address a little bit more in, in a vid that we do on the dark day, the day of the Lord, and whether 2012 might seem to some to be a great disappointment because they're not seeing the big, you understand, the big picture. So what we see in this picture right here, you understand, this is also speaking now about the whole Ophiuchus, you understand, Ophiuchus and, and, and the serpent and the particular... Um, point in the heavens you understand point in the heavens that is supposed to come up this is what it's supposed to look like from jerusalem israel perspective roughly 715 this is what the computers chart you understand the rotation of the heavens and the particular alignment that is supposed to come up around that time so we have right here we have ophiuchus you understand? We see over here we have we have Scorpio. You can't really see that much of um of uh uh Sagittarius in this particular view because of the tilting of it. But if we go to um the next the next presentation over here, let's try to move this. So now the gospel see the gospel is written the good news is actually written in the stars. And that's one reason why we feel that Stephen, um, Caduce Estefanos, was slain for such, for such a testimony in Acts of the Apostles. You know, when he looked up and he saw Jesus Christos sitting at the right hand, right, the right hand of God, you know, was... Um, they stoned him for that because what he was revealing, you understand, was this was this wisdom and this mystery written in the stars. So here we have Sagittarius, right? This is Sagittarius over here. This is Ophiuchus, and then I think um, um, and here's Scorpio. So you see the feet trotting on Scorpio. Now, let's see. Try to understand what it's saying right here. Here we have a wounded eagle up here, right? This is Aquila. Aquila, the eagle, right? We have a wounded eagle, eagle um, nebula, the eagle nebula. Some say this is USA, this is Mexico, right? Now we have um, North America. This is pictured as North America right here. Um, the serpent is pictured as Antichrist and the seed of the serpent. Then we have, this is part of the eagle um, nebula, then Ophiuchus symbolically is being interpreted here as Yeshua, as a Yeshua, and his followers restraining Satan and evil from taking over. You understand this rise in consciousness, this is what this rise in Christ consciousness, the true rise in Christ consciousness is all about. It's about Yeshua and his followers, his faithful followers, 
right? In my Father's house is many mansions. You understand? But we who are in that Father's house, restraining Satan, ha Satan, and the evil from taking over. Now, if you look further down here, here is uh, Sagittarius, right? Sagittarius, and we have the Corona Australis. The wicked is trampled to death, right? The wicked trampled to death. Um, the rider on the white horse, symbolizing now Christ or the King of Kings, even the Haile Selassie, the western, right? The western um, coast of the Americas. This is, to say, the western coast of the Americas under Owl. Notice what the owl is aiming at. The owl is aiming right here at, at Scorpio. Scorpio here would symbolize in the heavens Satan's evil plan to destroy humanity, the scorpion, the sting of the scorpion. Now, when we move over to Libra over here, Libra equals the scales. Here's Libra, Ma'at, the scales. Redemption of Christ's cross and our condemnation for rejecting it. So here's the redemption of Christ's cross, right? So we can see how the ages from the heavenly clockwork is moving. Now they say perhaps the blood moon of June 15th, 2011 in Ophiuchus, the serpent holder, it signifies um, North America's or the North country uh, temporarily inability to offer resistance against the Antichrist, question mark. That's interesting right there. You understand that North America, remember the North country is, is part of this prophecy. That's where the true Beta Israel is located, who are like to the children of the Ethiopians. See Amos 9 and 7 as well as Jeremiah, we'll touch on that, that verse right there. Now, lupus is Christ's death freely offered. Lupus, right here. Lupus signifying that. Now, over here we have Centaurus. Centaurus is Yeshua as the suffering servant, the suffering servant at his first advent. Then we have um, Ara down here, and Ara, for those of ones who know that, Ara will be the altar of the sin offering. You know, we focus some time on, on the altar. You understand? One can say even the foot of the cross. But there's a constellation known as Ara, or Ara, and that is the altar symbolic in the gospel, the true gospel of God and Christ written in the stars. That's the altar of the sin offering. So, so here's kind of a picture Right, here's a picture. So we have the archer, Sagittarius, the archer, Christ, the king, at his what second coming, trampling evil under his under his white horse's hooves. Under the white horse's hooves. And I can't um resist but but sharing with you um one pretty uh um beloved uh picture of the King of Kings in real time, you understand? Because he has these credentials, and both his 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 faith, right, and his work, you understand? Both his faith and his work of the King of Kings of Kedemawi, Haile Selassie, they prove who he is. You understand? In this prophetic equation of things, we have to now remember what did he do in real time. Do you remember the last time humanity was really faced by such um, such uh, destructive clouds? You understand? Who was it? You understand? Who was it that spoke both to, you understand, and for the conscience of the world? It was Haile Selassie. You understand? And who was martyred? Because they listened to that true prophetic and Christ and godly word sound, JFK. So we continually get to see these, um, these signs, right, these signs in manifestation. So when we are looking at, when we are looking at um, the true rider on that white horse, we're seeing the king of kings, we're seeing the children of the Ethiopians, 
prophetically right here. You understand? And His Majesty's witness, especially against um, um, nuclear. You understand? I think the nuclear thing is something that we, I think people are going to probably wish that they had spoken more out about this whole nuclear thing because His, His Imperial Majesty brought um, humanity, even according to the word of Christ, when Christ says that unless these days uh, should be shortened, you understand, unless these days should be shortened, you understand, none would survive, you understand, but for the elect's sake, for the elect's sake, these days were shortened. Now, I and I as the Rastafari people, you understand, we are the ones, the faithful especially amongst us, have kept the banner of the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, of Haile Selassie I, the elect of God, the king of kings of Ethiopia, while others have forsaken, forsaken his imperial majesty, those who love him and seek to do his will are worthy truly to be called by his new name and are the true sons and the daughters of the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. Now, we are this people of the black Messiah, and his majesty is this black Messiah, or as I and I say, universal Messiah. Now, our personal Savior, Yosin, in and through the King of Kings, Edomawi Hala Selassie, has already spoken to us and told us that now it is the time to teach ourselves again what we claim, Yosin, to have brought for the good of humanity. We must look to His Majesty, look to His teachings for guidance, especially in this time through our Lord and Savior and faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, Yeshua HaMoshiach, the black Messiah, the universal Messiah, the universal Messiah. His majesty is the king, is this king of glory who has entered into the world scene. This very son of man, if you will, entered into the world scene in these these last days of the Gentile world dominion, and who has declared us as a new race of the true new age and sent and signified this covenant, this word agreement universally to all people, fulfilling the ancient hope and expectation of the universal or the universal Messiah, the black Messiah as prophesied by the prophets, the Hebrew prophets of old, and contained in all of the former covenants and, and words of promise of the Old Testament and, of course, fulfilled in the New Testament. Even when we look at the Human Rights Declaration of 1945, this is a witness to the work of His Imperial Majesty, but whenever you hear about this Human Rights Declaration, very little you will hear said about Haile Selassie, about Ethiopia, about how Ethiopia were those, those first martyrs or the Ethiopian Holocaust that took place. Why against this particular black people with such ancient Judaic and Christian roots was this ungodly injustice done? I mean, what was behind that prophecy? Prophecy, my brothers and sisters, was fulfilled. And this is why many of the true black preachers of yesterday, you know, they recognized Haile Selassie, they recognized Ethiopia, and they made that connection before the Judas Iscariots came along and sold us out for... 30 pieces of, of silver rights, right? So his majesty, to his imperial majesty and to the witness of him and the fulfillment of the true spiritual goal of him, which is, which is establishing the kingdom of God on earth. You understand? Not the pie in the sky, so-called after you die, but, but doing God's work on earth. As the Our Father prayer says, you know, and our Father prayer tells us, you know, and reminds us that His will be done on earth as in heaven. So we're to bring the heavens, the true heavenly order, and truth and justice and righteousness 
on earth. And this is the true work of all true Christians. But now when we look at his imperial majesty's um, word, when he spoke to um, the League of Nations, a type of, a type of Gen Geneva, Switzerland, you understand, when we refer to some of the, the historical um, documentation, let's see if we can bring up that, that famous picture. We've used it elsewhere, I'm sure. Many of the brothers and sisters are quite familiar with his imperial majesty speaking before um, the League of, the League of uh, Nations, which was a type of um, kind of a globalist attempt back in those times. In fact, it's, it's when it all began. It all began when His Majesty basically stepped on the scene. When you really look at it, even Jehovah Witnesses talking about Christ will come secretly. Secretly because they will try to suppress the truth from you all as they wage war against the black Messiah. Now, His Majesty spoke both to and for the conscience of the world, just like the comforter of St. John's Gospel of the Christ in the 16th chapter is said to do. You understand? This address of, of his prophetic majesty was an appeal of the Ethiopian Nagusa Neges, the king of kings, Zetopia, on behalf of his blameless people, those those martyrs in the white garments go back to historical footage what you reading about in in revelations as as this woman going to the wilderness and the dragon is seeking to crush and wipe out the remnant of her seed this is ethiopia 1936 plain and simple reality you know what I'm saying? You've got to face the reality of it so his majesty appealed on behalf of, of his of his blameless people who are being genocide. In fact, the word genocide came into effect because of what happened to the Ethiopians, to the true children of Israel. Amos 9 and 7, aren't you like the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? Destruction was unleashed on them by the fascist aggressor, the invader, against this Ethiopian Hebrew, Judeo-Christian, black nation, and her God and King Haile Selassie I. At that time, we're speaking about 1936, this picture right here is, is circa that, that time, there was no respect for human rights. They didn't even know such a thing like human rights, but it's the, the Son of Man who would remind them, as Christ prophesied, the Son of God spoke of the Son of Man, and it's that Son of Man who, who reminded them of such a thing called human rights. You understand? And he provoked their consciousness to rise from its bestial, its animalistic, its tribalistic, its, its, its racist state to recognize the true light of the living Christ, of, of how Christ must be lived and, and, and walked out into the world. But wasn't this all written before of him? Wasn't this is what has been written? Doesn't the holy book say, why do the heathen rage and why do the peoples imagine a vain thing? And isn't it also written that the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers who at this time was the League of Nations, like today it gets us the United Nation and the and the and the Euro and all these other Gentile configurations take counsel together against Yahweh, against the Lord and against his anointed, against his Messiah, against his Christ. So so truly when we really speak about what's really going on here in, in, this, um, in this present uh, prophetic time. Let, let, let's bring this up, uh, this, this spiritual warfare against God, right, against God and his Messiah. So when we speak about um, God and Christ, and when Christ speaks about himself, the Father and the Son, we have to really recognize 
who it's speaking about both scripturally. You understand? And then when we look at this in, in, in Revelation, you understand? As, as now, Revelation reveals the truth. So we cannot forget this, although it's been suppressed from media as the whole world has become deceived and doesn't recognize the reality of the King of Kings and his Christ. It is our role and responsibility to seek to be faithful to, to preach this good news, though we recognize it might be hid from those whom the God of this world has, has blinded has blinded their mind. And this is hidden from you. We pray that your mind be unblinded. But needless to say, his majesty, his majesty's words, they went unheeded. But as he says of himself, he says that history testified to the accuracy of the warning that I gave in 1936. So the accuracy, you know, they say that if a prophet says, if one has the spirit of prophetic spirit, and if one says, and we know the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth doesn't lie, so his majesty spoke these words, and, and his words were fulfilled, even though at the time people laughed it off. They, they were like, whatever, that's just, you know, it's like if we talk about a polar shift. You understand? I mean, a real polar shift and a dark day, no technology, no light, no electricity, you know, back to life, back to the basics. But it wasn't until many thousands of innocent Ethiopians, Ethiopian Hebrews, Christians, suffered and died. And then later, after nearly the entire world became engulfed in, in, in the flames of what some call the second woe, or World War II, that the world leaders, who biblically, prophetically are the kings, who are they, they, they are the kings of the earth, do they decide that it was wise to heed our father, to heed our king of kings, Negus Negus, to heed Ketamawi Haile Selassie, to heed to Christ in his kingly character because humanity, my brothers and sisters, with all the insanity that was going on, humanity was on the brink of destruction. And I'm, I'm, I'm preaching on this because we're in a similar, tragically and sadly, we're in a similar um, state right now. We're in a similar similar condition right now, especially for all this talk of war and, and nuclear and, and then just all that's going on on the other levels with the strange weather and, and, and the signs of the times and men just going from, from bad to worse. But the League of Nations had discredited itself, and the mantle was passed to the United Nations, to the UN, to UN which is now located in New York, New York, the new Babylon Empire state. As his majesty, my father, our father, Kedamawi Haile Selassie witnesses, and we read, the charter of the United Nations expresses the noblest aspirations of man, the application of force in the settlement of disputes, the assurance of human rights, and the fundamental freedoms for all without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion, and the safeguard of international peace and security. But these two, as were the phrases of the covenant, are only words. Their value depends wholly on our will to observe and honor them and give them content and meaning. The preservation of peace and the guaranteeing of man's basic freedom and rights require courage and eternal vigilance, courage to speak and act, and if necessary, to suffer and die for truth and justice. Eternal vigilance, that the least transgression of international morality shall not go undetected and unremedied. These lessons must be learned anew by each 
succeeding generation. And that generation is fortunate indeed, which learns from others than its own bitter experience. These are the prophetic words that His Imperial Majesty would speak. You understand? I think we're about 27 or so years later, uh, in 63, before it was 36, when he spoke to the, to, to the old um, New World Order League of Nations thing. And then these photos right here, I think, from Life magazine, and I think one was from Ebony magazine. Um, um, the one on the left, I think, is, 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 is Life, and the one on the right was featured in Ebony magazine when His Majesty, His Imperial Majesty, Caduce Avatachin, when he came to um, speak before the, the United Nations. And when we study his words here, seeing the stance that he took against um, nuclear um, armaments, nuclear war, proliferation, and if anyone should be given due credit for um, buying some time for humanity against the nuclear insanity of, of like the 60s, surely in spirit and in truth, Haile Selassie would get the credit. But of course, they cannot tell you about Haile Selassie. You understand? Or they cannot, and they refuse not to tell you the truth about his imperial majesty. This is why you have to seek these things for yourself. You have to find the truth for yourself. But what his majesty says about about the charter of the the United Nations, the basic charter in principle is, is, is good. It's, 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 it's fear-sounding words. But what has what, what they did not hear from his majesty was the warning. When, 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 when he said that, um, that, 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 that these two, these words, are only phrases of the covenant, are only phrases of an agreement, you understand? Only words, and, and the value of these words, they entirely depend on our will. Whether we're going to um, do whatever we will to do, which is Satan's way, or we're going to take the, the highway, the higher road, and teaching of the King of Kings to make our wills obedient to the good influences and to do the will of the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christos, in spirit and in truth. Because if we do, then we would honor, we would observe it, we would honor it, we would give them content, meaning, and the preservation of, of peace and guaranteeing of man's basic freedom and rights, they require courage. That might be one of the reasons why it says in Revelation that the coward ends up in hell too, because since his imperial majesty's, um, for lack of a better word, disappearance, you understand, he appeared and then he disappeared, you understand the... The other stuff are just, just lies, basically, because they can't be proven to be true. I mean, how are you going to bury somebody, you know, like, like, like 20 years later, you know, and then have so much dispute about whose bones they really are, and it's too large to be the size of the person that it actually was. So, you know, you've got to kind of take some of those things, you know, take some of those things and cast them out because they're not true. But what His Majesty says right here, I think at the end of this is interesting, because He says it takes courage and eternal vigilance, courage to speak and act, that ones have to speak. The first level is speaking and then acting on it, and if necessary, to suffer and die, if necessary, for truth and justice. Eternal vigilance that the least, the least transgressed. Remember, this is 63. So this is somewhat dated, 63. Now, we look at from 63, you know, to uh, 2012 or 2013. Let's look at, uh, let's look at the, the, the number of places that, this, that ones were, were cowardly, that they did not speak, they did not act, they didn't want to suffer, they wanted to pleasure themselves, you know what I'm saying, they wanted to live for vanity. You understand? And allow suffering and injustice to go on. I mean, we could talk about Rwanda. We could talk about a whole bunch of stuff going on, you know, all, all over the world. You understand? That means that there were others that could have taken courage but obviously did not. You've got to find these ones out because you can't trust them. 
you know, saying you cannot trust them because where was the teaching of His Majesty reminding ones? I remember even this document that we have here. We call it Personal Savior that we wrote a threefold. It's, it's on the study page, www.lojsociety.org. You can download a free copy, print it, share it, you know, check it out for yourself. That um, most ones didn't even know about. You know, one time we had a spliff on our on ourselves and was taking a little walk down the street. This is like over ten years ago, right? And and Babylon, you know, there was a rookie that wanted to impress his female um, boss, sergeant, or whatever like that. So he pulled me over. I went to, you know, I went to the booking place, and I was telling him about my human rights. I even had a copy of the Human Rights Declaration on me, and it was really so interesting. I remember they were like, "Human rights? What? What's that?" I mean, the the, the faces of these police officers. You know, they train them certain basic law and legal stuff, but they don't train them for anything as human rights. Then we found that Babylon is so slick. They have their own New York human rights. It's like their kind of their own kind of not not the human rights that that uh, that that all nations have agreed to, but they have their own particular state New York human rights. You know, kind of a thing going on. It's not really real human rights, but it's kind of like you know the, your human rights. So saith um, Excelsior. So saith New York. But his majesty says that the least transgressions of international morality should not go undetected. But so many of them have. That's why we find these documentary conspiracy videos showing us stuff that's been going on and people knew about it and it's right out there and they kind of was teasing us, you know, with the media but not really giving us the full facts. So a lot of these transgressions have gone on, have, have gone unremedied. But here's the last part that we want to share with you with says, these lessons his majesty teaches must be learnt anew by each succeeding generation. That was deep right there. That each generation has to learn these things for themselves. And that generation, whichever generation that generation is, Yah's generation, Yah to lit, that generation is fortunate or is blessed indeed which learns from others than its own bitter experience. Well, now, of course, that connects with the whole education thing. Because if you dumb people down, you know, with wanting to be a dancer or a singer or a pop icon or like their favorite movie you saw the other day, you know, they're not going to really know too much. I mean, you can mold them like putty. You understand? They're not going to get this good news. You know, the guy of this world has blinded their minds to that that reality. So when we're speaking about um, this whole nuclear thing, I say to my brothers and sisters, we need to once again raise up, you know, rise up, you know, the banner of His Majesty's word sound concerning disarmament. You understand disarmament and, and to show the world that the real one is not Reagan. Reagan did nothing, you know what I mean, you know, basically, you know, for disarmament. But he's often given the credit by the Gentiles. You understand? Because of this sickness, you know what I'm saying, that, that, that some unclean white folks and even some black folks get it in reverse, the hate that hate produces, you know, it defects their melanin, and then they get the same thing that white people had first against black people, you know, and that's a whole other, you know, that's a whole other um, teaching right there. But we're going to go on to talk a little bit more about these years going on, because we see that um, as we're coming into this um, Passover season, you know, like I like to use this, we're still in the Passover season and the seven days. I like to use this picture right here. They had one where you probably see it where it's like a kind of a Jesus Christ-like figure is like knocking at the UN or something like that, you know. This kind of makes a little bit more sense right here. So you could tell it's a Eurocentric perspective, but they're not trying to throw it in your face. But here's Christ at the doors. You know the part in Scripture where it says, um, Behold, you know, like, um, it, it, I, I'm at the doors. And I think that if we go to, to this, bring this uh, Scripture up right here. Let me see if we can get the the tribulation timeline. Um, restore the tribulation timeline. All right, and okay, here we go. Uh, 
bring this back over here. Where is, um, oh, okay, right here. It says, Behold, I come quickly. Okay, Orion right there. But also when we start to talk about the doors, you understand the doors. What are these particular doors? I want to go into a little bit of it, but probably won't have the opportunity in this particular vid, you understand, to go into the doors, you know, the the spiritual, you understand, and the real, the actual stargates that enter into the Crystal City or, or New Jerusalem. And we think it's interesting when you look at these so-called um, either spaceships or motherships, and some of them look exactly like um exactly like a, a pyramid or or, or 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 two pyramids. Check this out. This is from an Ethiopic perspective, the Simentenyao Shi Kokeb or the, the star. You know saying the star of the eighth millennium. Some even liken this to the, the Bethlehem star. Now the earthquakes we want to bring all, uh, all this kind of to you, but there's a lot that you really have to begin studying on this because there's a lot of moving, as we say, there's a lot of moving parts, moving pieces that you have to be able to basically understand in some basic context. Now, just on New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem right here, so the doors, you know, these kind of like, uh, what we call them, like stargates, in a sense, the most interesting thing about Stargates, and we'll try to maybe do a whole vid, you know, touching on them a little bit more. If we bring up this Stargate right here, you understand, this is how, you know, the TV show and the movie talked about it. But what's the first thing you notice about the Stargate? What is it made of? It's made of water, right? Remember the river, Nile, the Nile River, also it's a boundary, but it's also symbolic of baptism. So we have the the these um the these uh stargates but well, there's actually stargates now biblically speaking in in the bible you probably have have read about it or heard about it as um and we don't know the name of the artist but we have i think the artist video for that that was an interesting rendition based on um his uh inspired um view of of uh of of what revelation if you put revelation into its um its perspective what kind of structure revelation even in um that 13 illuminati blood families where it talks about the pyramidical you know the pyramidical kind of structure in a sense you know and i think it's uh fritz springmeister he kind of talks about even god's system seems to have this kind of type of a, a shape too and after all whatever the devil kind of steals and, and, and misappropriates if it works he have to get the principles from from the true the true architect the true builder and, and that is the most high that is God the true God so we have here the, 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 the Jerusalem a type of a new Jerusalem now it's interesting that some of these spaceships that you might be seeing in some of the vids, like Ross Ben had a vid, and I wanted to do a little something where we take some of these designs and compare it to what um, some of these so-called um, uh, spaceships or aliens, you understand, these aliens. Now remember, Christ slash God, the Father, the Son, the triune God is called the king of what? The king of a heavenly army. So when we think about these aliens, like the media seems to be telling us that the aliens are here to do us harm or something like that. But we already know who's doing us harm. So, you know, you have to begin to, to reinterpret properly some of those things because um, when the game is on, so to speak, you know, you're going to have to know what you know as true. You understand? And can't have a lot of guesses or supposition because you already have made the wrong, you know, the wrong move because you're not really prepared. So we have the, this idea of a stargate right here, right? And then this symbolic from the Bible where, where Christ is pictured standing at the door and knocks. You understand? Now this, this a, a potential door, doorway, we were told eschatologically that this door is our heart, you know, and that if we allow his word, 
you understand, and his spirit to come into our heart and our life, well, that is a door, no doubt about it. That is a, even a chakra door. That's the fourth chakra between heaven and earth, between the three upper chakras or seats or seals and the three lower or uh, earthly, worldly, lower chakras or, um, or, or seals. Now, one thing we notice that the stargate there, it reminds us of these, these gateways that it would have, and there's a whole bunch of likeness to this and, um, this and the, the tabernacle, when we look at the tabernacle. But the next aspect that we're going to deal with, and before we go on, then we have this right here, which is um, interesting, the cycle, the so-called cycle of the moon or the lunar cycle. And we thought this was interesting as a, as, a, as a kind of a gate, too, because the Hebrews are told to reckon certain significant times and to be of a certain particular mind during these particular times. And this is in keeping, you know, this is in keeping with his, you know, with the Almighty's um, 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 separateness for his people. So that they, they have faith, but then they also... There's work that proves now and verifies their their true faith, so they keep certain things sacred, like like Sabbath, you understand, and count certain times by the heavenly calculation of it, which is according to the heavens, according to the moon, and and other basic signs like that, which are recorded in in the heavens. So we wanted just to touch on that just briefly as well as his majesty, mainly his majesty on, on this armament as we're getting into it's like it's like we're returning just to the time it's like they've they've managed the demons have managed to in a sense undo a lot of what he who rides on the white horse was able to buy.